Thank you and good morning. This is an impossible audience to talk to because uh, there's a number of uh, usual suspects and then if I could say unusual suspects, new people who are here to learn uh, about what's going on. What I've uh, chosen to talk about this morning is some of the knowns and unknowns that we have to deal with, some of the issues and some of the challenges, and hopefully there'll be something for uh, many of you in all of this. Peak oil is one of a number of current issues. Uh, here's a, a cartoon from the Wall Street Journal. I put Hurricane Sandy in there, which is something that uh, they hadn't thought about at the time. They included peak oil, but there's all kinds of things. And of course, we're in the middle of uh, recession and economic problems that are very significant. The problem, as far as uh, a whole lot of folks is con are concerned, is that uh, peak oil is not here now, and there are a lot of other issues here now. And so what it is we do in this area is often below the radar. There's also a lot of different folks that play in this, that dabble in it, try to understand it. There's oil industry folks who are very close to things. I can say that uh, in my years in the upstream at Atlantic Richfield, I never heard the term peak oil. I never heard anything about a maximum and a decline of world oil production. So a lot of those folks very busy doing day-to-day -day activities and not necessarily thinking about things broadly. There's economists who uh, don't understand uh, or don't seem to understand limited resources, and so prices go up. There's going to be more of it, not to worry. <laughs> Classical uh, economists, climate advocates that worry about uh, burning carbon, as you well know, clean energy folks that uh, are interested in things getting cleaner and better. There's the lay public that uh, is just trying to get by in a whole lot of situations and, uh, and so forth all of these people see the world and peak oil through different lenses. Start with some things that are known by the experts. First of all, oil is essential to our modern economies. It's a finite resource. We know that production from oil fields and countries rises, reaches a maximum, may stay on that for a while, and then goes into decline. That's the way things go, and that's the way they are. We know that many countries have passed their peak. We know that uh, there are all kinds of data and guesses out there about what world oil reserves are. A lot of that information is secret, either in OPEC or in, uh, in oil companies. And, of course, it's not independently verified. World conventional oil will decline at some point because it's a finite resource. The question, of course, is when might that be? It is obvious, though, and we know, and most people indicate that we're past the era of easy oil and just taking a look at oil prices over a significant period of time shows that something has, uh, has passed. We're beyond the point of easy oil. Peak oil does not uh, reflect in daily oil prices, which are primarily driven by oil supply and demand, but also you get economic outlook, inventories, political activities, uh, speculation, stock market movements, Middle East situations, and, uh, and so forth. I fear myself that peak oil price signal won't show up until it's obvious in front of us. Public lacks knowledge and is confused, and there's a lot of misunderstandings out there. People don't really understand how important oil is to their everyday lives. They don't understand, and people think on both sides that the oil companies are part of the problem or part of the solution. They don't understand what peak oil really means, but it doesn't sound real good. There's this uh, word going around now that the uh, North America is going to be energy independent in the not too distant future, so why worry about peak oil? People don't understand how long it'll uh, take to make changes to our energy system and our, particularly our oil-based system. They, they're used to thinking about how fast computers change and, uh, and software and hardware changes, so of course oil should do the same kind of thing, but that's not the case. And a number of people, of course, believe that renewables are the answer for everything. If we could only go tomorrow to renewables, everything would be fine. One of the big problems, huge problems, and I just, I'm amazed that people don't get this, 
they lapse into talking about energy and not differentiating between oil and other kinds of energy, particularly electricity. Oil is liquid fuel, liquid energy. Energy can be in a variety of different forms, as we all know. There is something like 50 to 100 trillion dollars worth of machinery around the world that is built to operate on liquid fuels, on gasoline, diesel fuel, and, uh, and so forth. And you cannot change that overnight. It's a huge cost. The magnitude of making those changes or even retrofitting in places where you can do it are really significant. People don't understand that, and it's very important. Experts agree, I think, on a number of things. Uh, they also disagree on things. What is oil? And I'll touch on that in just a minute. And what is peak oil? How much oil remains? Uh, when will oil production begin to decline? That's a huge question. We all uh, have different views on that. Many have different views. How fast will it decline? How big is OPEC and their reserves? Will OPEC or can it, in fact, step in when there's a problem elsewhere in the world? How much oil can we get out of shale? What's the impact on economies of a uh, decline in, uh, in world oil production? How can we mitigate? How fast can we mitigate? What's the role of government in all of this business? How fast can renewables impact? No question that longer term uh, renewables can impact, but in the short term in equipment that requires liquid fuels, there are very limited renewable options. What's the Im uh, importance of energy research on, an, uh, on investment? And then there's this big issue that a lot of folks are focusing on, and that is climate change versus peak oil mitigation. Start with the definition of oil. Unfortunately, there's a number of definitions floating around, and that's extremely unfortunate. And to me, what's happened recently with uh, more uh, natural gas liquids and, and other liquids coming in, people don't understand that there is a limited set of sources that can produce what we need today, gasoline, diesel fuel, jet fuel, and, uh, and so forth. We've got conventional oil, we've got biofuels, we've got all kinds of things. And my question was, is there a better measure? I uh, sent an email out to a number of friends and colleagues, got some uh, things back on this, and I'd like to describe what we, uh, what we came up with, which I think is worth some consideration. And that is the problem, the primary problem, not the total problem, the primary problem is going to be transportation fuels. So maybe we ought to focus in specifically on transportation fuels and see what they're doing and watch them as opposed to looking uh, more broadly. To make an estimate on this, I went to the BP statistical uh, review and picked out uh, light and middle distillates and fuel oil. That's where most of the transportation liquids are. There's a few other things in there, chemical feedstocks and so forth. And this is what BP's data shows us, it shows us an increase over time. If we go back and take a look at the plateau, which many of us have focused on, the plateau is associated with total liquids. And there you see a fluctuating plateau region. These are annual uh, numbers uh, put together that uh, is something like 4% uh, in width and has been uh, in that range since 2004, 2005. But look down below, what I just showed you shows kind of a linear increase. And if you begin to think about that, you begin to think about what refineries can do to maximize the output of and maximize the revenues uh, which are highest for, uh, for transportation liquids. So it seems to me that this is the major concern, but I throw this out for all of you to uh, think about to the extent that you wish. Playing with this and getting into it, in fact, provides some uh, useful focus and, uh, and insights. I understand I spent time in the refinery business as well as the upstream part of the business. Of course, refineries can uh, change within a certain range without too many new pots and pans. They can, uh, 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 they can maximize their transportation fuel output. The production plateau doesn't show there, and I think we need to understand uh, that. Clearly more detail needs to be done. 
John La Herrera has indicated that the data in the world on this is not very good, and so doing fine scale uh, analysis here probably doesn't make sense. I was aided in this by Shell Alicolet and Chris Skabrowski, who uh, provided uh, some very useful uh, insights. What's the definition of peak oil? The organization is called Association for the Study of Peak Oil. It made sense, but I don't like the term. Shell, and I apologize to you personally, he and I have gone around on this uh, uh, a few times. Past the peak is supposed to be disaster, and yet there was a peak declared by IEA in 2006, and there was no disaster that followed that. I, I'm just not happy with that particular uh, situation. People tend to think in terms of a production plateau and falling off of that. I prefer to think of the onset of decline in world transportation fuels, and I don't know how to make that up into some catchy uh, little phrase like, uh, like ASPO. Recently, Chris Skabrowski has uh, played with the idea of economic peak oil, where he brings in the cost of oil and what that does to economies and so forth. So that's another dimension of the problem. I think we need clarity, uh, but we'll probably continue to use peak oil. A lot of this stuff is heavy, but I thought a cartoon here and there might not be bad. This was a cartoon I absolutely loved. Uh, it came up when uh, folks in, uh, Quebec, in, uh, in uh, Kuwait uh, uh, said, uh, actually used the term peak oil, and everybody, <laughs> uh, their neighbors said didn't like it, and uh, that's a great cartoon. How much oil remains to be produced? There are lots of estimates out there, and experts differ. Uh, what would really work in principle is to have world oil fields looked at sharply by competent, capable people, providing then good, solid third-party estimates for what's involved. But OPEC isn't going to open up. Most international oil companies and others are not going to open up. And by the way, there's not enough professionals out there to do, uh, to do that. So uh, I, I think getting really good data before trouble hits is, uh, is likely impossible, the impossible dream. Even if we had it, would that move policymakers? It's a good question. I think we have no choice but to use best estimates. The huge question, they used to say $64 question uh, back in my younger days, now $64 trillion question might be a way to look at it, is when is the stuff that we really care about about to go into decline? A number of us, myself included, a number of people in the audience here feel that it's going to be relatively soon. On the other hand, industry and OPEC and EIA and others say not to worry, don't worry about it, it's off in the future, worry about the, the other things that are here in the near term. And then the question is how fast will it decline? A uh, good estimate by cooperating professionals might be possible, but uh, then again, since you've got people with uh, their own horses and things that they're concerned about in their own lives, uh, that may be idealistic. Picture that I had from before is uh, the European picture, plateau followed by a decline, in that case something like 6%. Is it going to be like that? Remains to be seen. One of the questions that a number of people have looked at is the rate of decline of existing oil fields. And here you have a number of things that we had from an article that uh, uh, Shell and I and uh, uh, his, uh, his student then, uh, Mikhail Hook, uh, did together a couple of years ago. Uh, CERA saying 4 to 5 percent, ExxonMobil 4 to 6 percent, Schlumberger said maybe 8 percent. Uh, Pickens, before he started changing his tune, uh, is talking 8% IEA, you see the numbers, and then we had 55 to 6.5%. Uh, so there is reasonable agreement in that, that what's happening with existing production is that it's declining at significant rates. And of course, to keep things flat, one has to make that up on an annual basis, and that requires something like four to seven million barrels of per, day, uh, per day just to stay constant. How big are the OPEC reserves? Uh, there are people who worked there decades ago. There are other people that have some uh, insights. Uh, Matt Simmons uh, did a book looking uh, 
at SAE uh, and, uh, uh, data and, uh, and papers and so forth. Uh, we really don't know what it is they've got. And then if we look back to what happened in the mid to late 1980s when they changed their quota system, and their quota system then became uh, uh, based in part on reserves, magically within a couple of years everybody's reserves approximately doubled. And they didn't find anywhere near that kind of oil. So it's very difficult to go on the basis of their word. And again, is, that, is it even knowable? Will they meet the demand? Can they meet the demand? Uh, the, uh, uh, the king in Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago said, any new oil that they find, they're going to save for the long term. And a good king would do something like that because it doesn't make sense to spend something that is one of your few resources quickly. It makes much more sense to stretch it out over time. No consensus and maybe not even knowable. The big thing recently is uh, the Bakken and other uh, tight uh, shales, which were uh, uh, getting a uh, uh, cons considerable amount of oil, of oil out. The people, the proponents, the folks that are selling stock and uh, wanna, want you to buy their stock and so forth say it's, it's extremely large, everything is gonna be terrific. The Bakken extends uh, from North Dakota where the biggest resource is into uh, Montana, and if you look at the data from Montana, it has shown a peak and, go, and has gone into decline. And that kind of suggests that maybe what's going on in North Dakota, in fact, may go into decline in the nearly, terribly distant, not terribly distant future. There's no independent look at all of this. There's a number of guess, guesses uh, being made, and there's no consensus there. It's a big unknown, in my opinion. Then there's the question of the economic impact. The economic impact is going to depend considerably on the decline rate. The question also is what, uh, what, what's the public reaction going to be? Because I was an adult in 73 and 79, and I saw the public reaction to uh, the cutoffs uh, and uh, the shortages that occurred there, and there was chaos. And by the way, my view is that even though the economic situation today is different than 73 and 79, people are the same. We still react. All of those other folks who aren't in this room still are going to react to bad news. What happened back in those years is they were brief shocks, as you well know. There was public shock and panic. There were oil shortages and gas lines. There's a one picture, famous picture of uh, people waiting in line. In fact, we saw some of that uh, recently when the problems hit on the uh, East Coast with the hurricane. Uh, declining uh, stock markets. The fear and the uncertainty caused people and companies to pull back. And that means not hiring new people, that means even letting people go and not investing and so forth. We got rising unemployment in those days, increasing interest rates, and we had inflation uh, and, uh, and recession. World GDP and oil consumption, as many of you know, are tightly correlated. And here's a picture going back to 1968, and it shows oil and it shows uh, uh, real GDP, overall energy consumption. And so there is a tight coupling between those things. So when world oil production does go into decline, it will drag down economies. And I don't care what models you want to use, I totally and firmly believe in this. You cannot deny the correlation. The same thing is true in agriculture. As oil prices went up, food prices have gone up and then they've come down, and uh, they are also reasonably correlated, so we're gonna have problem with food supply and food prices. How fast can we mitigate? This is something that a number of you know that we dug into uh, back in about 2003, 2004, came up with our DOE report in 2005. We looked at a crash program. We looked at what is the very best that was possible I'm not going to go into this because you've talked to, we've talked about it before. The upper limit, and the upper limit indicated that indeed it's going to take you at least a decade, if not longer. We assumed an overnight step program into a crash program. That, of course, won't happen. 
politics won't allow that to happen. People are going to have to think about it and play with it and decide what to do. And if there's anything like the past, a number of politicians are probably going to make uh, uh, some uh, mistakes in what it is they do. Uh, questions uh, here. Uh, we assumed a very simple model so you could look at it. There wasn't uh, uh, data hidden in computers that you could always uh, have to wonder about. And we looked at uh, increasing uh, in a number of major areas. Uh, one of those areas was uh, the oil sands in, uh, in Canada. Uh, Shell Alicolette and his folks uh, in, uh, in subsequent work uh, indicated that you can't keep going. You can't keep going much above maybe five or six million barrels a day. Key thing in this, a key thing, absolutely, is deployment of what exists now. You're going to have people that are hurting very, very badly. They're not going to stand for research and development and waiting until something gets done. Politicians, of course, are going to react to all of that. Oil decline, the way we're going, will have had a head start. And I put together just a little picture of uh, a couple of runners here because this is a rates race. Even though we have a worldwide crash program, once we get started and get moving very quickly, we're racing after somebody who has started out and will be running slower, but they'll still be ahead of us, and so it's going to take time to catch up. You can play with that sometime on your own. What's the government going to do in this particular case? They need to recognize the reality and they need to communicate honestly to people. They have to decide whether they're going to do this themselves, which I personally think would be a major mistake, or whether they're going to clear the way for industry to do what's necessary. Will they clear things out? Yes, they can do that. In fact, a little known fact is that a number of years ago, the Congress wiped out all the environmental and permitting concerns associated with building a fence along the border between the United States and Mexico. So in fact, you can clear things away so that in fact, things can happen very, very quickly. They're going to have to impose rationing. I don't see any way to avoid that. We covered that in our book and a number of other people have talked about it recently. It's very, very difficult to do. All you have to do is get by that simple word rationing and get into the details, and by golly, this is it's extremely de uh, difficult. Government's going to have to take care of the, uh, the needy, and of course, we don't give up on research and development because longer term, there are going to be better things, and so we've got to continue that kind of thing. What about renewables? A number of people say, peak oil, go to renewables. Well, not many renewables produce liquid fuels. Wind and solar produces electricity. Electricity doesn't going to work in my car, even though I'm driving a, a, a Prius. It's not a plug-in uh, Prius. Uh, to get electric cars on the road is going to take a long period of time under the very best of conditions. And if we are in a recession, you're not going to be selling that many cars. And if you take a look at what happened after 2009, you can see the drop-off in the sale of new cars. There's going to be competition in biomass, which is a liquid fuel, with uh, food production, and food is already going to be a problem. There are in, bio, in biomass, there are environmental concerns, and some of them have very low EROI. It's going to take a while, but I think when there's a lot of pain everywhere, people, in fact, uh, are going to understand that doing something about peak oil is very important. EORI, EROI, very important. Uh, Charlie, are you here? Hope you're here someplace. There you are. Uh, pioneer in, uh, in all of this business. We all understand how important this is. In the short term, you may have to go for low EROI technologies in order to be able to provide something. If you could even, if you in the extreme could turn electricity into liquid fuels, even though that's an energy loser in a number of ways, it still puts gasoline into cars. Climate change, climate change mitigation, a lot of controversy in that particular area. A lot of people care about it, uh, of course, very much. Again, when the pain and suffering is obvious, then the longer term concern about climate is going to take a back seat. Public relations war. We're about as low, I think, as we can get. IEA and others are saying not to worry, everything is fine. Uh, America is going to be the new Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and so forth. So as far as public relations are concerned, we ain't doing very well. Okay, in conclusion, this problem is simple and it's also extremely complicated. 
Many people, a number in this audience, have made outstanding contributions and more is needed. We need solid thinking and analysis and we need good communication at different levels with politicians and all those folks that I showed you uh, up front. Rapid mitigation, I think, is absolutely going to be essential and it's going to be a huge task. It isn't going to happen quickly for a whole lot of reasons. Why that arrow going down and coming back up? Because I continue to be an optimist and that is after we're through all of this and we will get through it, we'll be much stronger. Thank you very much.